chapter twenty one of in search of mademoiselle by george gibbs recorded by tony oliva this librivox recording is in the public domain we form an alliance that night as we slowly crept up the bahama channel under the resplendent tropic moon i told my story to de gourgues he heard it throughout saying no word but sighing now and then his melancholy eyes looking down the glimmering streak into which we were sailing as into a glory that this strange man had once been loved and had passionately loved in return i did not doubt for despite his ugliness of visage there was that in his expression which would command the adoration of women who often reckon deeper than by mere lineaments of feature and softly illumined as he was by the pale and ghostly translucence of the night i thought no more of his ugliness but of his soul for he was transfigured and looked in his calmness even as he looked in all the majesty of passion inspired and of this world a thing apart when i had done he put his hand upon my shoulder saying it is not often that englishmen love as you do my friend build not your hopes too high for you have suffered much to suffer so much again it will not be long before we shall know we shall know and he paused sucking in his lip ominously after that he took my hand and said i have taken a great fondness for thee mon ami and our solemn duty performed what can be done shall be done upon that you may rely we will first sail to the northward of the river of may to the indians of saturiona if what the chevalier de brezac says be true they would be willing allies upon this expedition de brezac hearing his name spoken now joined us we were wondering seigneur how great a value to set upon these indians of yours de gourgues said i have ventured but an humble opinion my captain replied brezac but i would stake my honour that there is no love lost between saturiona and de bassan de bassan the dispatchers had said was the new appointed commander at san mateo i pray god that it may be as you say for a palisaded fort of stone with half a thousand men is no slight obstacle even for the brave fellows of the fleet of the vengeance all of us who have been at fort caroline know of the love which the great paracousi bore for jean ribault dario the trumpeter who was with the first expedition has lived among them longer than i and he has boasted that he will go among them without fear it is in my mind to sail directly to the country of this chief his boast may not prove an idle one replied de Gourgues and then to the guard pass the word below to dariol the trumpeter we shall see presently the man came from the forecastle and stood before us you have no fear of the indians of florida dariol asked de gourgues none more than i have of monsieur Killigrew or monsieur de brezac my captain replied the man with a smile you have lived among them longer than monsieur de brezac a year and more my captain they were friendly to monsieur de laudonniere until the madness for gold when his soldiers broke faith with them and monsieur ribault asked de gourgues saturiona thought the admiral a great chief monsieur le chevalier they swore an eternal friendship monsieur de brezac says you speak their language dariol as i do my own you know their customs how think you they will look upon our landing monsieur replied the trumpeter firmly 
i believe with monsieur brezac that if they think us spaniards they will dispute our landing if we prove ourselves frenchmen and friends they will receive us with gladness why so it is my belief that they hold the spaniards in great enmity for no arrogance will be borne by saturiona he is a great king with great pride of spirit and numbers his people by many thousands but the spanish have friends among the indians monsieur de brezac has said so yes my captain but they are the false-hearted dirt eaters of utina against these saturiona wages a war more fierce even than against the spanish de gourgues stroked his moustache saying when we reach the coast i will call for you dariol for the present that is all the man saluted and went below par la mort his words ring true as steel muttered de gourgues if these caribs are valiant as he says we will sweep this scum of pestilence from off the western land the next day at noon we sighted the coast of the terra florida and at the thought of all diane had suffered there my heart welled full of emotion now as we came nearer and nearer our missions ending the cloud fell down upon my spirit again and the same struggle between hope and fear of pain which is the price of joy tossed me to and fro held and freed me like the embrace of some temptation the sun was yet above the foyard when we came in sight of the river of may but to gourgues wishing to reconnoitre stood on until sunset when we were within less than three leagues from the coast suddenly we saw several puffs of smoke spurt from the beach as the spaniards suspecting no enemy fired their cannon in salute not until then did we know of the new defences which the enemy were putting upon the shore at either side of the river's mouth our three vessels to better keep up the guise of friendship boomed forth a salute in reply after which we put out to sea again and soon lost the shoreline in the rapidly falling dusk the river that the indians of saturiona call takatakuru after the name of their second greatest warrior enters the ocean by two mouths at a distance of not more than fifteen leagues to the northward of the river of may within the bar there is a safe harbor and it was for this haven that dariol and the chevalier de brezac were directing our course but not wishing to pass over the bar until day de gourgues held out to sea not coming in sight of land again until well into the forenoon then the river entrance being easily discerned he put his helm over and entered the channel coming safely to anchor at an early hour of the afternoon now that we had come to our journey's ending there was a great stir and excitement aboard the little vessels of the fleet the arm-chests and ammunition lockers were opened and all hands put merrily to work setting the arquebuses to rights fixing new match cords seeing to the barrels and rests that no disaster might befall them by reason of any negligence of their own the grinding stones were brought out into the sunshine of the open deck and the grit of the polishing steel and the rattle of the pike-heads made music brave and martial to the ear the seamen sang about their work as the lighter yards came clattering down upon the deck and the culverins unharnessed from their sea apparel shone anew in the brightness of the summer sun the shore upon both sides was plain to the view at a distance of half a league and once or twice 
we saw the dusky figures of indians upon the beach boudelet and one or two of the gallants unaware of the plans of de gourgu were for going ashore at once and giving battle but he was in no haste when he was ready for all emergencies he would go and not before night fell again and with the coming of dawn a great surprise awaited us for in the gathering light we saw that the beach was alive with savages they made no sound but stood in groups as far as the pines where they were lost in the misty shadows of the forest behind them here and there a figure was moving from one group to another and we knew that their runners had gone out to, to the nearer villages and that they had assembled to combat our landing de gourgu frowned as he came upon the deck carbleu he scowled there must be three thousand of them at least fools that they are i have no men to waste upon such carrion as these you are a wise soothsayer monsieur de brezac monsieur replied the chevalier with some dignity i have only replied to your questions with the best of my understanding but these red devils de gourgu continued are armed to the very finger-nails they look from here little like the allies you have promised us monsieur de brezac oh dariol come aft de gourgu was striding up and down in a ferment he saw his anchors gone and his plans set adrift by this unexpected resistance when dariol came he stopped before him savagely and pointing to the dark mass upon the beach said with scorn look you master trumpeter at your friends yonder look i say must we cut our way through all this red vermin before we may reach the spanish fort explain it if you can what has happened dariol wore a most serious face the matter is bad my captain for these indians are surely bent upon war well if we can approve our friendship we shall not land without a battle tis plain as a pike handle said bourdelais a pretty pickle sure enough monsieur de gourgu and you thought interrupted de brezac quietly that they may take us for spaniards but even so seigneur i am willing to take a risk if dariol will go with me i will go to the beach asking for saturiona a murmur arose among those within hearing it seemed to many a most daring thing to offer for to our people many of whom had never passed the borders of france these indians were as wild beasts or africans fit only to be shot or captured as slaves for me i believed with brezac and having been at the council table with saturiona i foresaw little harm if he were put among the natives upon the beach so when dariol said that he would go i too offered my services but to gourgu in his uncertain and dangerous mood was of a different mind i have no humor to lose all my men upon such a fool's venture he said dariol may go if he have the hardihood monsieur de brezac seigneur interrupted the chevalier this man must be rowed ashore he cannot talk and make signs to these indians rowing at the same time it is i who first offered this service de gourgui frowned debating for some little time but at last gave orders that a boat should be lowered to the water every persuasion that i might i used upon him until i saw that further argument were mere waste of words he would not let me go no 
he said shortly we are already too small a number were you to go i should be sending not three but six men and that were already far too many with great anxiety he watched dariol and de brezac drop down into the boat they had no weapons and had removed their doublets to row the better dariol had put in the bow a number of small trinkets such as mirrors knives and strings of beads with which he hoped to show the signs of friendliness the morions of our arquebusiers lined the bulwarks for the company thought these two men were going most surely to their death no word was spoken and the sound of the oars plashing in the quiet water of the harbor came down clearly upon the breeze from the land as the little craft drew nearer the shore when half the distance had been traversed we saw dariol lay down his oars and stand up in the bow shouting antipola antipola waving a string of beads in his hand this brought forth a chorus of cries from the beach and the savages came down to the water's edge shouting and waving their bows but to brezac at the oars not even turned his head at the outcry he bent steadily to his work like a london waterman sending the boat at each stroke nearer and nearer the moving crowd the excitement upon the ship was intense for in a moment the craft would be grounded upon the beach in the very midst of the enemy most gallantly done said de gourgues beside me below his breath dariol began shouting again asking for saturiona but in the commotion we could not hear what further was said then something happened for we saw a tall figure come out to his waist in the water holding up his hands before him in a moment the boat disappeared in the human wave that engulfed it as the indians surrounded it upon every side seizing the gunwales and running it up on the beach it was a most confused mass and we could make out little of what was going on a fellow up forward shouted they have killed them they have killed them and a great cry arose on the vengeance which drowned the yelling of the savages upon the shore some of the indians were jumping into the air throwing their bows aloft and Boudelet, who was looking through the glass said haltingly i see them there is the shirt of de brezac the three of them are holding him no they are then excitedly upon my faith they are clasping him by the hand they are touching dariol upon the shoulders it is friendship seigneur friendship de gourgues snatched the glass from bourdelais hand and fixed it quickly to his eye you are right bourdelais they walk up the beach my comrade they converse together ah it is well it was now patent to all on board the vengeance that no harm had befallen our comrades and there was great rejoicing for there in plain sight walked dariol and de brisac talking with the indian who had walked into the water who by his stature white shoulders and dignified bearing i made out to be none other than saturiona himself after a while we saw the boat push off from the shore and make for the ship dariol and de brezac rowed in the stern we marked the figures of saturiona and several dusky savages at this de gourgues ordered the company to be drawn up upon the deck and prepared to welcome his strange visitors over the side with all the state and formality he would have shown a king of france 
it was a course which diplomacy suggested i had not before seen saturiona in his war dress for at fort caroline he and his braves had come smoking the pipe of peace and wearing a small headdress and only the asium or breech clout upon the body as his broad shoulders rose above the bulwarks we saw that his hair had been lifted upon his head and two eagles feathers painted with streaks were stuck upon it upon his breast was painted a picture of one of those beasts which had so frightened us in the swamp an alligarto which was the totem of his tribe streaks of red and white paint were drawn upon his face making his features fierce and threatening i should not have known him but for his bearing for at fort caroline i had thought him a most comely savage rugged and strong-featured but of a great calm and dignity behind him walked olotoraca a young brave his nephew and takatakuru the second great chief of the tribe they bore no weapons but walked past the ranks of the pikemen and arquebusiers making no sign of any emotion as they went with de gourgues below to the cabin here he had caused a feast of wine and preserved fruits to be set forth of which the indians took sparingly after this goddard's pipe uh, and what remained of his tobacco were brought forth and de gourgues lighting it himself passed it to saturiona who solemnly puffed it and handed it to his neighbor de gourgues luminous eyes went from one of the chiefs to the other as he considered the words best to use in the delicate business before him dariol stood behind his chair ready to interpret i have come to the country of the great saturiona he said at last to bring him presents and to continue that friendship which was begun by the great white chief ribol saturiona nodded gravely so it has been said i and my people are glad i thank you great chief in the name of my country and of my great master across the water who in love and good will has sent me said de gourgues from necessity speaking of the king of france he has sent me to give you many gifts which will be useful in your lodges as well as in the hunting my master knows of the kindness of the great saturiona to his servant ribol and prays that this good will and friendship will continue through the passing of many years saturiona arose with great dignity and spoke his heavy voice made to resound under the vaulted arches of the forest rang mellow and deep in the little cabin i have said to the great white chief ribol that the sky shall fall upon the earth sooner than i will become an enemy to the people of your nation since the great stone house was taken by these dark-bearded ones there has been no happy day among the people of the nation of saturiona the sun hides his face behind the clouds and the flowers and fruits have ceased to blossom and ripen there is a blight upon all the land and the rivers and streams dry up like the blood which flows from our hearts the spanish have beaten us back with their sticks which speak a loud noise and they have burned our cabins they have ravished our wives and daughters they have killed our children and our hearts are heavy and ready to burst within us for shame and anguish 
saturiona paused to give his speech a greater value all this we have suffered because we love the great white paracousi ribol but now the end has come we can endure it no longer and we will make a deadly war against them until the tribe of saturiona is no more or the people with the black beards are beaten back into the sea out of which they came again fortune seemed to be favoring us the display of force was meant for our enemies not for us we knew the joy de gourgues must have felt but no sign of it showed upon his face in europe his reply would have been called diplomacy it is a great sorrow to me o paracousi that the love which saturiona bears my people has brought ill-treatment upon his tribe but such things shall be no longer if his nation has been abused for the love of the french then the french will be his avengers as this was interpreted by dariol we watched the face of the paracousi slowly as the truth of what had been said dawned upon him saturiona rose from his seat and leaned forward upon the table looking over at de gourgues a broad smile upon his face what he exclaimed will you fight the spaniards i came here replied de gourgues rising only to reconnoitre the country and make friends with you and then go back and bring more soldiers but when i hear what you are suffering from them i wish to fall upon them this very day and rescue you from their tyranny the effect of this speech upon these indians was great their faces usually stolid and expressionless broke into smiles and all their dignity and quiet was swept away by the joyful tidings their voices rang through the narrow cabin as they rose to their feet and in rough gutturals and cries of their own wildly applauded the words of the avenger it was some moments before quiet was again restored for so great was the joy of saturiona that he had no better control upon his composure than olotoraca the youngest of his chiefs when the indians were seated again de gourgues raising his hand commanding silence continued it is most certain o paracousi that this expedition is no play for children for those we must fight are sturdy men well armed and sheltered in a fort built of many thicknesses of stone you must summon the greatest chiefs and braves of your tribe so that we shall make good our promises we do not covet all the honor of this victory and will share that as well as the spoils of the battle with you and your people we will go replied saturiona solemnly uplifting his hand we will go and die with you if need be it is well there should be no delay if we fight we should fight at once for it will not be many suns before the black beards will know that our great white canoes have anchored near their fort this should not be for what we do we must do in secrecy when this was rendered into his language saturiona drew his knife from his belt leaned forward lifting his hands and elbows crouching the very picture of keenness and stealth his voice was low and threatening like the murmur of the rising storm in the tops of the giant firs of the seashore do not doubt said he do not doubt we hate them more than you can do after this there followed a long discussion upon the best method of attack upon the fort saturiona asking but three days to send his runners to outlying villages that there might be no lack of warriors for the expedition 
it was decided by de gourgues to send three scouts at once to learn the strength and position of the two forts at the river's mouth as well as many details of the new armament of fort san mateo end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of in search of mademoiselle by george gibbs recorded by tony oliva this librivox recording is in the public domain olotoraca during all this talk my mind in a ferment i was forced to sit with elbows glued to sides unable to put the query for mademoiselle which trembled upon the lips even as i listened to what was going forward i had kept my eyes upon olotoraca the nephew of the great chieftain as he sat leaning forward with hands upon his knees listening to the words of dariol it was a wonderfully handsome face and even the hideous streaks of crimson upon it could not disguise the regularity of the features and the expression of candor and fearlessness which animated them and the pride of his port was that of a prince heir to some great kingdom as he glanced about the cabin from time to time i caught his eye and gave him a look of welcome which he returned with a smile the sun coming in the afterport lit up the scarlet streaks upon his face and headgear and penetrated the ferocious disguise reducing him after all to his proper dimension a fine brave lad of five-and-twenty who if born an englishman would have served his queen with honour and profit so i took the mind that this olotoraca should be the one with whom i would speak of mademoiselle not until the planning and discussion of the attack upon fort san mateo had become general could i get the ear of de brezac and then i told him what was in my mind olotoraca said brezac when at last we had come together it will not be many suns ere your crest will wear another eagle feather you will go upon such a war-path as was never known among the tribes of saturiona or takatakuru and when you come back to your village there will be many trophies upon your girdle and you will be a great chief among your people his eyes shone as he said simply it is so or i shall be dead you may one day be paracousi of all your nation after the great saturiona is gone it is to you that our people will look for friendship which has been begun to-day the paracousi saturiona and olotoraca are one in all their thoughts for is it not from him that olotoraca has learned the signs of the forest and the medicine of his tribe how shall he change what saturiona has done what saturiona does is good and shall not be altered it is wisdom olotoraca for the french are a great people and they love their friends with their whole hearts at fort caroline monsieur killigrew and i have fought the utinas and the spaniards for saturiona and soon our chief with the pale face will revenge the insults and abuses which the black beards have put upon you the young brave at the mention of the name of killigrew had sent his cold glance upon me with startling abruptness as though to pierce me through for the nonce he was a wild animal of the forest again then he looked calmly at de brezac killigrew the pale giant is called killigrew he muttered the words half aloud half to himself and then tossed his head so that the bear claws rattled about his neck you have heard my name i asked the captain 
kiligu is a friend of the paracuzzi imola a friend of imola is a brother of olotoraca he replied easily a look passed between the chevalier and me there was that in the manner of olotoraca which we could not understand but de brezac had made a quick theory of his own and acting on it as was his wont he put his hand upon the muscular shoulder of the young warrior turning him about and looking him steadily in the eyes we believe in the truth of the things you say olotoraca and for our part we will keep our promises but you what have you done for us since we have been away what will you do for us when we are gone the indian did not look at de brezac but straight before him we will keep friendship as we have ever done he said evenly asking no more than we can give you have kept friendship with our people said the chevalier craftily and i saw his drift then you have among you those who escaped from fort caroline a great change came suddenly over the face of the young brave he flashed the eye of a hawk first at the chevalier and then at me de brezac was impassive i was leaning forward the query that was vexing my soul hanging upon my tongue his face lost the boyish look and in a moment became again as it was when he mounted the entering ladder haughty and immobile there is but one of your race among us he said carelessly a youth who calls himself de Bray. he is at the village of the paracuzzi saturiona and will be brought hither on the morrow it all happened thus as i have written it twas but a second of time that his eyelid fluttered at our sudden query as he sought to gain his composure but in that brief moment there was that which showed us that the personal friendship which this young brave avowed was no friendship at all but only breath upon his lips and in no manner to be believed if something had happened to make the indian distrust us twas no good beginning for our foray and these doubts must speedily be cleared if success was to attend our undertaking for my part i was so sure olotoraca was lying that i made myself no concern over his denial a french youth named de Bray had escaped and had been cared for then why not others if saturiona was a friend of the french then all refugees should be safe in his lodges after the indians had been set ashore again and de gourgues had been told of the manner of olotoraca he stroked his chin gravely you are certain of some deception hmm, that is strange for i have found a great frankness in the manner of the paracuzzi but it may be as you say and we will be upon our guard against him tis most certain that these caribs do hate the spaniards with a mortal hatred and we must show no doubt of them until our mission is accomplished so i say do nothing to gain their enmity even should you believe that friends of yours are in their keeping these were orders and he spoke them firmly but all night long i strode up and down the deck under the deep vault of starlit sky trying to hit upon some plan by which i could learn the truth why had olotoraca started at the mention of my name imola had spoken it he said but my return to florida should be no cause for alarm or even surprise to him since in the presence of that chief we three de brezac goddard and i 
had sworn to visit vengeance upon the spaniards and emola knew that we would return as soon as could be unless our judgment was at fault there was some matter of common interest between this young carib prince and me for the chance perception which had enabled us to pierce the weak spot in his armor had shown that there was something in his mind against me which in spite of his accustomed immobility he could not hide what could it mean the instinct of battle and the desire to measure my strength and skill against any man who looked at me askance an instinct which has not been taken from me even at this day rose up strong and i vowed i would have some fair good exercise from this fellow should he not explain perhaps mademoiselle ah there was i making mysteries again why should i be for ever bringing her forward into every uncertainty at any rate de bray the boy would know if she were among the indians he could tell me where upon his speech then hung all my chance of earthly happiness early on the morrow we went ashore and with a ruthless disregard for the orders of de gourgui i set about trying to find olotoraca but since dawn he had been gone with our scouts to reconnoitre the spanish fort saturiona was at the encampment sending out his runners and receiving messages from the outlying villages he received us gravely and took us to his lodge lifting the deerskin at its entrance with a grace and courtliness to excite the envy of a gallant he gave some orders and when we were seated and de brezac asked him who were the french people that had escaped into his hands he looked at us from the one to the other saying most frankly we have only one my brother and he is but a boy because of the love which we bear his people we have kept him safe though the spanish have offered us many gifts to return him to the fort we love him now for himself and have made him one of our people behold he is here and turning we saw a youth of sixteen or thereabouts standing at the entrance of the lodge for a moment he drew back awkward and fearful and would have vanished had not de brezac called to him in french no we are no spaniards mon cher but those of your own race come then so great was his joy that with a cry he threw himself upon us clasping and patting our hands for all the world like some dumb animal at the sight of its master saturiona cautioning us with a smile not to do him hurt wrapped his blanket about him and went out of the lodge down to the beach to meet the boat of de gourgui which was reported to have left the vengeance de bray was a slender lad of comely appearance but neither i nor brezac remembered to have seen him at fort caroline when his first transports of delight were over and we had told him that our object was to destroy the fort and to restore fugitives such as he to their kinsmen he looked at us in dismay saying of his own accord alas messieurs i am the only one who has been spared that was all i wished to know i would have arisen and gone forth from the lodge but brezac looked at me laying a hand upon my arm wait said he then said the chevalier to the boy you alone escaped from the fort did you come direct to the indians of saturiona i fell in with a war-party of takatakuru 
they brought me to the chief village of saturiona you saw no other persons from the fort oui monsieur there were several men who fled through the swamps but no women no monsieur stay yes there were two women who fled by the casement before me and whom i saw in the forest do you remember them pierre oui monsieur they were ladies who came upon the trinity with admiral ribault they were noble i think though i do not remember the name uh, la 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 not yes that is the name monsieur i know it now because mademoiselle was very beautiful and when we landed from the gloire i asked my mother how she was called and you saw them no more after that we leaned forward breathlessly to get the boy's reply monsieur i was wild with fear he said flushing red in shame my mother had been killed before my eyes and two spaniards had pursued me to the breach on the wall i fled to the forest passing these women in my flight i ran on and on until i dropped exhausted in the thicket you have not seen them since in the head village of the indians he asked wide-eyed with surprise no monsieur they could not have been in the village of saturiona or i should have known he spoke with an air of conviction which drove away doubt from the mind but de brezac pursued his questions undeterred there is a village called takatakuru is it not so oui monsieur is it possible that other french persons could have been kept there without your knowledge oui monsieur said the boy wondering but why should the great paracousi who had been so kind keep me away from the people of my race i cannot understand you may know in time my good pierre but there is a mystery which you may help us to solve only let no word of this come to the ears of the paracousi monsieur said pierre firmly saturiona is my father and if any harm ah my child you do not comprehend smiled de brezac we are friends of saturiona and with him we will fight the spaniards you must take our word that we mean him no harm i will monsieur replied the boy at last sighing it is well mon ami you will have no cause for regret said de brezac you have been to the village of takatakuru he continued no monsieur it is a day's journey from the village of saturiona did you not wish to go oui monsieur but there was no opportunity the paracousi olotoraca feared i should be captured by the spaniards olotoraca oui monsieur the paracousi olotoraca has been a good friend and brother to me ah i understand he thought that you might be captured again but why should you fear capture on such a journey is not the village of takatakuru to the northward of this place away from the fort of the spaniards i do not fear monsieur replied de bray with dignity but if the paracousi olotoraca did not wish me with him it was not possible for me to go then he did not desire you to go that is what i wish to learn said de brezac with a smile then after a pause why did olotoraca go to the village of takatakuru is he not the nephew of saturiona is not his place by the side of his uncle the great paracousi monsieur the paracousi olotoraca is a great brave and the first young chief in all the country 
he looks about him that he may choose a squaw from the most beautiful maidens of the nation therefore he goes to takatakuru this is the common report then he loves the women there are beautiful pierre so it is said monsieur though having seen none of them i cannot say perhaps that is why he did not wish me to go or perhaps that is not the reason i cannot see that is all i know and i pray that no harm may come of the words i have spoken never fear good pierre you have done well now if it pleases we will go forth to meet the chevalier de gourgues you will tell him what you have told us and as much more concerning the armament and condition of fort Mateo as you have been able to learn from the indians will you go to Kiligru, or will you await us here i will stay said i with a sigh dropping on a pile of skins the chevalier looked at me sharply Pooh! have you no instincts no perceptions you grow weary at a most purposeful time but i did not reply of a truth i was weary so many times had i sailed these flights of fancy to have my poor sails torn to shreds and my poor hulk racked bone from bone that i was for choosing at the last some harbor of refuge where i could find a rest after it all i had come with my hair-brained followers over a thousand leagues of sea and for what for murder for destruction for a vengeance by fire and sword as the others had no it was not that which had drawn me to these god-forsaken shores drawn me more surely than ever plummet sought an anchorage it was the memory of a pair of honest eyes with tear-drops trembling on the lashes as my lady bade me go and fight her battle for her a battle which by god's grace had been deferred until now true i wanted the life of de bassan that was my own private affair but what cared i for their wars about religion there was sin enough in any worship which was not done in the way of peace and good will and i knew that we as well as the spaniards would all be most justly condemned for using god's altar to wipe our sword blades on with the discovery that mademoiselle was not in the village of saturiona my mind seemed to be weakening and i had not control over my thoughts the chevalier de brezac with his fine philosophy had solved the matter to his satisfaction seen in the actions of olotoraca at mention of my name a sure sign that for reasons of his own he held mademoiselle de la notte a prisoner i could not nay would not bring myself to believe she was at the village of takatakuru a truce to imagining i had gone too far and suffered too much to be inventing new theories to drive me mad we had voyaged from one end of the earth to the other and had come at last to the place where i had sworn we should find her and she was not there that was all i had had enough god forgive me as i lay there in my unreason i lost all control and cursed all things that came to my tongue forgetting that it was only through god's providence that i had been let to live and come to this day not caring what came of me i lay there oblivious until i presently heard a sound without i raised my head a figure darkened the door of the lodge for a moment i thought it was pierre returning 
but a moccasined foot was thrust forward and with a deft and graceful movement the figure dropped the skin at the entrance way and stepped within the lodge then i saw that it was an indian a girl the most beautiful of that race i had ever seen as i lifted on my elbow i brushed my hand across my eyes for so quiet was she i thought truly that this dusky vision was some creature of the fancy with a commanding gesture she approached i would have spoken but she placed her finger upon her lips looking around toward the entrance in token of secrecy i kept my peace at last she uttered the one word mahira and touching her breast with a long slender finger i understood that she was telling me her name the words uttered in a quiet tone seemed to come from her throat rather than from her lips and her voice was very low and sweet when she had said that she touched me upon my arm calling me keely grew as though my name were some word in the soft language of her own i marvelled that she should know me and could not understand what she wished but in a moment her object was clearer for she began to speak in the sign language which these strange people have for conversing with one another when their tongues are unfamiliar of this i understood a little she had several french words and she moved her lithe young arms and body with wonderful grace telling me by pointing to her dusty moccasins and simulating weariness that she had come a journey from a great distance to seek me i nodded my head in comprehension then her face grew sad and her body seemed to melt to nothingness she clasped her right hand upon her left and laid them both upon her heart saying the name of olotoraca so gentle soft and lingering was the word upon her tongue and so melancholy her attitude no language could have told plainer that her heart was hers no more and that a sadness had come upon her she sighed deeply looking upon her hands and fingering her silver bracelets i put my fingers upon the head in pity for i too knew what heart wounds were but at my touch she shrunk away and her mood changed like an april day the look she flashed up at me was one of pride and majesty and there was a spark of vengefulness of wild unreason in it that taught me how concealed and subtle were the channels of her thought she wanted no pity none from me at any rate in a moment she was gentle again telling me that she had come from the village of takatakuru and with a gesture which i might not mistake that she was a princess of the blood it was not till then not until she had mentioned the name of her tribe and village that i even so much as thought upon the object of her visit to me then the suspicions of the chevalier the associations of the names of olotoraca and takatakuru linked her story together in my mind in some fashion she had come from takatakuru i started up drawing in my breath quickly and looking her in the eyes what if if she saw the note of anxious and expectant inquiry in my look and met it with a smile and sparkling eyes we oui, we oui, she cried in joy the moon princess the moon princess i understood this was no millstone to look through 
i remembered the name saturiona had given to mademoiselle at fort caroline the darkest hour of my night was past and it was dawn that was breaking end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of in search of mademoiselle by george gibbs recorded by tony oliva this librivox recording is in the public domain the moon princess taking Mahira by the hand and lifting her to her feet i pointed to the entrance of the lodge where the sunlight was sifting through and motioned her to lead on with a friendly look she put finger upon her lips again and peered out across the clearing she shook her head and lifting the skins at the rear of the lodge motioned me to follow soon we had crept through the thicket into the forest and went rapidly down the long aisle of pines at last the sounds of the indian encampment were merged into the voices of the wood a bird was singing somewhere and the sough of the wind through the tree-tops overhead somehow brought back in a sudden flood of memory the nights at sea when mademoiselle and i journeyed towards this wild western land it had all come so suddenly that i was bewildered as one who has been rudely awakened from a long sleep truly i had been sleeping and the hideous pictures i had dreamed were false de brezac was right after all it was his keenness of perception that had guessed the truth it almost angered me to think that my intuition steadfast through all these long months should have failed me at the time when my heart was nearest its desire but i was too near happiness to let any other emotion enter into my soul i hurried on through the forest with mahira who regardless of the heat of the morning and the roughness of the travelling moved on beside me seeming not even to touch the ground and giving no sign of fatigue her soft moccasins made almost no sound among the dried branches while i unskilled in woodcraft crashed through them awkward and heavy-footed raising many a bird and beast which scurried away into the underbrush terrified at such noisy and unaccustomed intrusion but for all that it seemed to me as though my feet bore wings and once or twice i found myself going at so round a pace that my companion was sore put about to keep up with me then with an exclamation at my lack of thought i reduced my gait and we went along more reasonably side by side her mouth was set and she kept her glance before her upon the ground she had traversed this distance once before during the hours of the night but no complaint or sound of any kind came from her throat at about noon when i wished to know the distance of the place to which we were travelling she looked at the sun and pointed to the heavens signifying that at an hour midway between noon and sunset we should reach our journey's ending once only did we rest when i feeling that the pace must be telling upon her stopped and pointed to a fallen tree she shook her head and would have gone on had i not taken her by the hand and led her to a seat placing myself beside her and offering her a mouthful of eau de vie from the flask which by some good fortune i carried we ate a few wild berries and then hurried onward we had gone what i should have thought to be a distance of five or six leagues when there opened out in front of us a quiet valley with many fields of grain which 
cut into the hills with squares of green and yellow beyond by the border of a river which lay like a silver snake in the meadows was the smoke and village of Takatakuru. mahira wishing to conceal the object of our coming had not chosen to go straight as the eagle flies from the encampment of saturiona by taking a roundabout way we had escaped the curiosity of the braves of takatakuru who were hastening to the great war dance and the black drinking which saturiona had proclaimed before the attack upon the spaniards mahira halting upon the edge of the clearing made a sign to me and we stopped she motioned me to take my place behind her and following a thicket we moved cautiously encircling a ploughed field in which two women were working presently we passed the trees upon which they had hung their babes this being their custom and i thought we must surely have been discovered for the infants made sinister wry faces when i came close to them and seemed about to cry out but mahira crept up crooning in a low tone and saying some phrases in her soft voice held them quiet till i got by and was safely in the underbrush of the forest beyond we walked silently for some time longer threading the mazes of the forest and at last mahira led me trembling at the nearness of my happiness to an open place within a close growth of great pine trees where several lodges neatly thatched and cared for stood in an enclosure then with a smile the indian girl beckoned me on and pointed to the entrance of the palisade i walked forward upon my tiptoes craning my neck here and there in a very agony of expectation mahira fell noiselessly behind me and the crackling of every twig beneath my feet seemed to shake me like an aspen but we must have made little noise for we reached the gate of the palisade without notice and scarce daring to breathe i looked around the entrance post mademoiselle was there she sat upon a wooden bench beside the door of the lodge her look was turned toward the west and she did not see us as we paused upon the threshold of the palisade her hair was cast loose about her shoulders the breeze played wantonly with its meshes and the slanting sun burnished it with a golden glow like an aureole she was dressed like mahira in deerskin and so pale a gem did she seem in this rough setting that her very slenderness and fairness startled me into the dread that she was translated and no more a creature of this earth i feared to move and break the spell that held me but an indian woman who sat opposite weaving glanced up at this moment and despite us and then my mistress turned her head mademoiselle i cried coming forward mademoiselle it is i she started to her feet but casting a fleeting glance upon me turned half around and fell senseless upon the ground mahira was on her knees beside her in a moment and together we carried her within the lodge and laid her upon a bed of skins and hemlock boughs it was not until then that i saw how wasted she was i cursed myself for the boor that i was to burst upon her so what if after all she had suffered she was to fade away like a flower under my very eyes it were better that she had been struck down among the first at fort caroline what if i had killed her the misery of that moment i fell upon my knees 
raised my voice and prayed to god who had watched so long over her that she might be spared the moments passed anxiously maheera forced eau de vie between her lips and at last with an intaking of breath that racked her from head to foot she opened her eyes and looked to where i knelt beside her my anguish all unconcealed ah yes she sighed i remember now it was silly of me i have never done so before but i am so weak so weak brave little heart undaunted and strong even in her weakness nay sweetheart it was i who startled you blame it to me god knows i rather would i cut my hand from my body she laid her soft fingers upon my wrist hush she said gently i know i have learned i know how you love me dear she paused as she gained her strength while i mutely worshipped then she went on reverently it is that which neither time nor distance can alter it has been with me always and so i knew that you still lived and one day would come for me i had no answer but to press my lips upon her slender wrist she closed her eyes for a while and seemed to sleep while i sat beside her in great ferment of mind at her suffering but soon maheera came into the lodge with a bowl of some steaming herb this mademoiselle drank with relish and maheera propped her up with robes and branches as she grew stronger the faint colour came back into her cheeks it is over now she asked at last yes it is over there shall be no more suffering your friends are here and you are safe she leaned back her head closing her eyes and sighing contentedly presently as a thought came to her she started up from her pillow olotoraca she said half in alarm where is olotoraca i set my teeth as i thought of the haughty young brave and his lies to me in the cabin of the vengeance you are the prisoner of olotoraca mademoiselle if he has there there vex me not now sir firebrand she smiled but mademoiselle nay i am aweary vex me not there must be no anger between you two what cannot you understand he can be no enemy to you but he lied to me he would have concealed you and kept you from your own people yes i am his prisoner but you must listen to me and do what i ask of you when you know you will say it is rather a debt of gratitude than of blood that you owe him say on dear heart i will listen then it is this she paused fingering the robe olotoraca loves me sidney nay do not scowl so blackly for shame and he but a savage creature of the woods can you not understand it is a kind of worship though he comes often to this place he stands aloof and waits upon me as though i were a very queen content only to look and do my bidding asking for nothing and hoping for nothing that i could not give but he has kept you here where else could i go good sidney here was everything this country affords i have been safe and cherished by his people and this old woman and the gentle maheera guarded until last night when they were called to the war dance by his own braves with never a fear of beast or spaniard sidney it was this paracousi who saved my life from de bassan it is he who has preserved me against their expeditions presently you shall know 
ah you wrong him to doubt for a moment his service or his intent has he not saved me for you no 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 there must be no more blood no more blood where is he mahira she inquired anxiously where is olotoraca there is no need for fear said the girl olotoraca is at san mateo ah i am thankful mademoiselle gained strength rapidly happiness does not often kill and as for me what could i say the mastery of my spirit was no easy task but as i looked at her and thought of all her suffering there was nothing i would not have done for her i resolved not to wait for olotoraca but to take her away aboard the vengeance before he returned afterwards when i learned of the battles he had fought in her defence upon my soul i began to have a liking for the man as i had at first sight of him in the cabin of the ship the love we bore made this red chief and me a kin just before sunset my lady having slept a little called mahira to her the indian girl put her dark fingers upon the fair brow tenderly stroking the hair away from the temples and sighing mademoiselle understood the easier words of the indian tongue and their signs and spoke a few words to mahira asking her why she was sad the red blood of the indian came to her face as she answered it is that the skin of mahira is not fair like that of the moon princess olotoraca looks no more upon the maidens of his own race the moon princess will soon be gone it is that also which makes mahira sigh for now that she has brought the white giant to take her away mahira is sorry it is best so mahira but why did mahira not say that she was going to bring the white giant mahira does not know only late last night came a message to takatakuru saying that the white canoes of the french had come but why did she think the white giant would be with them mahira smiled because the moon princess many times had said that he would come and well because she wished mahira was confused she could not acknowledge that it was jealousy she wished she wished to please the moon princess it was my lady's turn to flush ah mahira she laughed shaking her finger you must not tell these things the simple straightforwardness of the indian nature would not permit her to understand for she opened her eyes in wonder mahira thought what she did was good mademoiselle replied not but i told mahira by signs that her heart was a heart of gold then said my lady will mahira grieve when the moon princess is gone not so much as olotoraca will grieve but mahira will be here and he will soon forget the moon princess mahira knows not she is sorry she loves olotoraca with all her heart but she has no hatred for the moon princess she will think of her and love her always even when she has gone into the water of the coming day there was trembling in the soft voice of the maid it is a sadness to make so true a friend only to lose her again the following morning with many pauses mademoiselle told the dreadful story of her sufferings nicolas chaleux had spoken the truth for hidden in their hollow tree covered by branches diane and madame lay concealed throughout the terrific wind and rainstorm of that frightful night and through the terror of the next day i did not press her to tell me more than she offered for it grieved her to the soul to live over again that unhappy time with hushed voice 
she told how she had fallen into the sleep of utter exhaustion and had wakened to find her hand clasped in the icy one of madame whose white eyes showed that she had died of fear she shuddered as she told of her escape upon the second night worn almost to death by the agony through which she had passed of her struggle worn and draggled more dead than alive to the river upon whose bank she had fallen from exhaustion then her face lightened a little as she told how an indian warrior had discovered her in the long grass and how he had carried her stealthily to the hiding-place among the takatakurus but a spanish soldier had seen her and three times diego de bassan had come himself to the camps and villages of saturiona telling of the death of the sieur de la notte and of the massacres upon the sand spit asking for her and offering great rewards if they would return her to the fort saying that she should be treated as a princess spanish spies were always upon the track of olotoraca but he wary and skilled in woodcraft had ever slipped away from them save once when two of them traced him to the palisade they had surprised him at a time when no guards were about the enclosure fearing to arouse the takatakurus they would not fire their arquebuses and so set upon him both at once with their swords with his spear he had pierced one through the neck the other taking to flight he lamed badly with an arrow so badly that the fellow could not get back to the fort to tell his discovery but was killed that same night not a league away could i wonder after the tale of this service that mademoiselle would have no bloodletting between the paracousi and me then i in my turn sick even at the memory of it told how the braves of imola had found the ring with the ancient setting and how i had given her up for lost and then i learned how she had given this ring to a waiting-maid of the household of laudonniere in recompense for her kindness and service to madame thus all was explained that night when we had eaten we went out into the sweet-scented woods and seated ourselves upon a bed of moss under a wide-spreading oak the sun had set and the twilight fell down upon us warm and soft as the touch of velvet the breeze had blown into the west where great banks of clouds hid the last glorious rays of this wonderful day of ours for a long time we sat silent fearing to break upon the hush of the animate things about us every twig was sleeping and over us fell that deep mysterious spell of the giant forest which linked us with time for the nonce we were instincts only symbols of nature a peace with eternity we were so happy that we knew how little was the meaning of mere words at last mademoiselle sighed deeply it is the end of travail she said the world is as tired and content as we thou art so content i asked bending over her she drew a little from me smiling not too content monsieur perhaps it is by contrast with what has gone before she said it with a touch of coquetry that last ingredient which goes to make a woman 
for all my boorishness i understood yes thou art happy i can see it in thine eyes as for me i will be happy when i see the roses blooming in thy cheeks again she made an impatient gesture for shame upon such loutish speech thou art not happy i would say you would say that the roses bloom not in my cheeks but mademoiselle am i so pale monsieur and so uncomely in my life i have heard nothing so ungallant think you i can find mirror and lady's maid in this wild place monsieur if you like me not scorning further parley i had but one answer for this protesting a little soft gray squirrel belated had come down from a tree near by and sat upon his haunches switching his tail and looking at us most curiously upon my word i find you a most forward person said my lady brushing back her hair from her temples and i by your leave find you most impertinent and therefore quite strong enough to make a journey with me then we may get away to the ships on the morrow and you are willing for me to carry you the colour flushed again into her pale cheeks as she cast down her eyes upon her deerskin leggings and then strove to pull the short skirt to cover over her knees what matters it my diane i whispered and besides when the fort is taken we may find a minister or a priest but she clapped her hand upon my mouth and would hear no more End of chapter 23chapter twenty four of in search of mademoiselle by george gibbs recorded by tony oliva this librivox recording is in the public domain we advance before the sun had gilded again the tops of the loftiest pines mademoiselle mahira and i had started upon our way i had counselled traveling in the afternoon but in spite of her weakness mademoiselle was impatient she feared that by some mischance olotoraca might return we marched on bravely covering two leagues before the heat of the morning when we made a halt that mademoiselle might rest she vowed that she felt no weariness but after all that had befallen her neither mahira nor i had the humour to see her pressed we knew that she would have walked on until she had fallen from utter weariness before she would have spoken a word of plaint there was no need for haste in the depths of the woods there was little to fear if we reached the encampment of saturiona by sunset i would be well content for mademoiselle could not safely be conveyed aboard the vengeance save under the cover of darkness the attack upon fort san mateo could not well be made for two days for mahira made sure that not until the war dance and the black drink were over would her people start upon their journey to the southward as we rested there in the deep shadows of the forest i told mademoiselle of dominique de gourgui and of the chevalier de brezac and what they had done for her and for me and how much i owed the avenger on her account and on my own when i had finished telling her of the plans of de gourgui she gave a sign of fear the only one she ever showed you will go she cried starting up you will go to the attack of fort san mateo i took her hand in mine mademoiselle i said in anguish that she should be so troubled mademoiselle can you not see my word is pledged i must 
i must go her hand clasped mine convulsively and she turned her head away i had hoped hoped that you would not that you loved me more do not say it dear heart you do not mean but it seems so hard i have been so long alone alone and forgotten my diane do not make it even harder for me do not weaken now you who have been so brave i put my head in my hands for i was grieving sorely my suffering seemed to give her strength no no she whispered forgive me i meant it not i am not myself i wish you to go it is a just fight if god wills that you should have victory then you will come back to me safe if you are defeated i raised my head with a smile never fear for that dearest there shall be no defeat in two days we will return in a week we will be sailing for merry england and then with a smile as for me my diane why i promise you upon my word that even if affairs go badly i will still return to you unscathed i shall bear a charmed life and when i see that there is danger i shall stand in the ranks of the laggards in the attack and if there is ever a tree big enough to hide me there will i stay until the fort is won mademoiselle was laughing through her tears by this time nay that you will not she said proudly if you go you shall be nowhere but in the very fore of battle there speaks my brave diane but it is impossible we should fail with these indians we outnumber them three to one and by secrecy we will fall upon them as they fell upon fort caroline and take them before they know that we have come yes said diane all will be well we cannot have been separated and thus brought together to be again ruthlessly torn apart god has been good to me if there is to be further suffering but i cannot believe it i will not and now starting to her feet en avant monsieur in this way by resting often we came towards sunset within a short distance of the harbour and encampment then by making a wide circuit to the left we passed the indian trail and by stepping stones crossed a small stream which ran into the harbour down this we walked i carrying mademoiselle much against her will in my strong arms until at the right we saw the glare of the indian fires upon the beach and the glimmer of lights which showed where the vengeance and the other ships lay at anchor when we came to another crossing place mahira bade us wait while she went forward toward the encampment by this time olotoraca must have returned from his expedition to the spanish forts i hoped that mahira would escape his notice but i doubted not that she could explain her presence at the camp to his satisfaction in spite of this assurance it seemed a long while before she came back several times we heard the sound of footsteps and thinking that some keen-scented indian might have wandered upon our trail and be following it i drew mademoiselle deeper into the thicket while i feared no injury i knew not what complications might come should the escape of diane be discovered to olotoraca i had disobeyed the orders of de gourgues in following mahira and i was in something of a quandary how to have mademoiselle conveyed aboard the vengeance to safety i knew that i had some stormy moments before me with de gourgues but felt that 
could we carry forward our object and bring mademoiselle aboard the vessel secretly his displeasure would speedily pass by and i trusted much to mademoiselle could he resist her he were less than a man after a time we heard the footsteps not of one but of two persons and presently maheera's soft voice called out through the darkness from the crossing place where we had been in a moment we were together there was de brezac my good brezac whom our little guide had found at the camp he embraced me with great joy saying that de gourgues was much perturbed over my absence but that he himself had believed i would return safe and sound to mademoiselle he bowed with a grace which would have done him honour at a levee bending over and kissing her hand and telling her in courtly phrase how long he had looked forward to this moment i thought it savoured too much of paris for these rough woods but nothing the chevalier de brisac saw fit to do was greatly out of place mademoiselle for her part told him in her sweet voice how deep was her debt and the chevalier like all others who saw her thereupon vowed himself for ever to her service i told him straightway that he might try his service now since mademoiselle had no humour to swim to the ship yes good sydney he replied and you have come near enough crossing the plans of the avenger to set a smaller value upon your life than i have put upon the spanish if i mistake not you yourself will need some further service from me but i will see stay here and i will return as soon as may be and so he departed alone by and by the red glare of the indian fires increased and a murmur which at first rose no higher than the distant booming of the surf upon the beach came to our ears there was a measured and rumbling noise which i did not understand maheera craned her neck and put her hands to her ears it is the war dance she said excitedly the dance of the battle olotoraca is there i can hear him they are playing upon the tawagans to-morrow they will drink the black drink then they will go in a little while the glow of the fires seemed to light the whole firmament and the sound of the voices and the drumming rose to a prolonged and savage note louder and wilder it grew swelling into a vengeful and relentless scream more animal than human which seemed to rend the very sky the dancers saw themselves already victorious at san mateo and fiercely cried their desires to their gods of war and vengeance so piercing were the shrieks that the beasts of the forest were aroused and we could hear their answering howls come now and then from the woods behind us even the birds started from their perches fluttering down past us crying shrilly to one another in fear at the unwonted turmoil mademoiselle shuddered maheera missing no note of this savage chorus said proudly olotoraca dances first and dances longest olotoraca is a great chief it seemed long before de brezac returned but when he did it was with the news that de gourgues had been placated and that a boat had come ashore for us down the beach my good friend said he never in my life have i seen a man so glad or so angry at the same time he walked the cabin driving his heels fiercely into the deck upon my life one would have thought it was not you but i who had disobeyed his orders you might have set the whole tribe at enmity 
for all the difference there would have been in his demeanour when i could find a pause i told him all mademoiselle saved and olotoraca in ignorance and he swore the harder saying a man who obeyed not orders had no conscience and was better dead in his heart i think he secretly rejoices for no matter what the result of our venture mademoiselle may stay aboard with bourdelais and so be safe all of this and much more he told me as we walked behind mademoiselle and maheira to the boat which we found upon a sandy beach at some distance from the indian camp in half an hour we had hooked the entering ladder of the vengeance and i breathed a sigh of relief when mademoiselle was over the side and safely upon deck de gourgues stood by the bulwarks and bowed low over the hand of mademoiselle conveying her himself to his cabin which was brilliantly lighted in honour of the event but of me he took no more notice than if i had been a liar or a sweeper he requested de brezac to go with them and i saw through the open door that food had been prepared then the door was shut and i was left in darkness to muse upon my indiscretions i leaned upon the taffrail somewhat sadly for twas not a brilliant homecoming for me for a long time it seemed i stood with job goddard watching the whirling shapes at the indian fires and listening to the savage cries of the dancers tis time them spaniards was a-prayin master sidney said job there's a smell of blood about this here ay job i replied i'm sick of it at last the cabin door flew open with a clatter and the chevalier de gourgues himself came out upon the deck shouting pass the word for monsieur Killigrew. i walked out of the darkness and stood before him in the glare i have come aboard sir i said doffing my cap my eyes are reasonably good monsieur said he most sharply and coldly looking up at me like a gamecock for some moments nor have i a custom of any incertitude of mind but supper lot i am of two dispositions about you he leaned forward scowling i was much disconcerted you have placed all my plans in jeopardy and i know not whether twere best to hang you to the main yard or to blow you to perdition with a powder charge but his rigidness fell away from him and he broke into a merry laugh you could not wait eh my beef eater par la pac dieu i blame you not i blame you for nothing not if you had disobeyed the orders of the admiral himself he took me by the arm and led me into the cabin where mademoiselle tired but content was smiling at us the lady pleads your cause well monsieur said de gourgues she has my service this time i forgive you but remember he laughed if it happens that you disobey her and he paused if you disobey her there will be no spar upon the vengeance high enough to bear your bones by midnight the sound of the mad revelry upon the shore had ceased and in the silence of a night which held a deeper content for me than i had ever known i fell into a deep and dreamless sleep the following day was consumed in the final preparations for the attack and in the drinking of the black drink by the indians it is a custom with them before they go into battle or danger of any kind to drink as much of this concoction which is the brew of a kind of leaf as they can hold they believe that it purifies them from all sin 
and leaves them in a state of perfect innocence and inspires them with an invincible prowess in war de gourgues in order to show how strong were his prowess and sympathies pretended to swallow the stuff but he afterward told me that when he found the opportunity he had poured a quantity of it out upon the ground it was evening before the indians gathered their weapons and filed off into the forest it being agreed that the french should go by water and meet them before the attack de gourgues had no further need to encourage his men the excitement was at fever heat and aroused to the very bursting point of enthusiasm they tumbled down into the boats with ready weapons and purpose that could know no turning francois bourdelais with twenty sailors was left upon the ships in the event of failure he was to wait as long as might be for the men to return and then set sail for france mademoiselle was safe at any rate i was glad that she did not appear upon the deck it would have savoured too much of that day when i had left her upon the bastion of fort caroline but among the excited frenchmen there were many embracings and many messages to wives and mistresses after that they went blithely enough for it was a wonderful venture on which we were going we were about to attack four hundred hardy well-trained men in a stone fort where with reasonable skill they might hold their own against an army we were well under way before the darkness swallowed up the dim shadows of the ships hour after hour of that calm half tropic night we pulled at our oars gliding softly along by the sombre shores sliding now and then over a pebbly bar but moving ever slowly on to the southward with the soothing murmur of the surf in our ears and the balsam of the land breeze in our nostrils in the gray of the dawn we came to another river and a breeze sprang up from the sea which by sunrise blew with violence from the northeast here we found our indians waiting upon the bank for a while the gale delayed us but our frenchmen would not wait long rowing at last boldly across had it not been for the morians with which they were forced to bail incessantly they must surely have sunk as it was the boat in which i was conveyed with de gourgues was half full of water when we arrived upon the beach when we had landed and put ourselves to rights led by the avenger we pushed forward on foot through the forest by the side of the captain marched olotoraca armed with bows and arrows and a french pike to which he had taken a great liking looks of friendliness passed between us i doubted if they had been so friendly at least upon his part had he known the arquebusiers followed while de brezac and i with our armed seamen brought up the rear all of that day until five of the afternoon pausing only to eat and drink we hewed our way through the swamps and thickets toward our destination then almost spent by hunger and fatigue we came to another river or inlet of the sea which dariol interpreting for olotoraca said was not far from the nearest of the spanish forts at the mouth of the river job goddard footsore and weary brightened at the gleam of the water odd soons master sidney tis a mighty sweet sight do we take to boats again now sir for my legs have little energy enough unless i may sit down to my work tis a bad fight i'll make this day for poor salvation smith sir 
when we had crossed the river in the canoes which had been sent we found three hundred indians waiting for us but tired as he was de gourgues would not rest with olotoraca and ten arquebusiers he set out to reconnoiter for he wished to attack at daybreak when we rested night closed in and finding it vain to struggle on in the darkness among the tangled vines and fallen trees de gourgues was forced to return to us anxious and gloomy after he had eaten something a brave of the chief olotoraca came to him saying that he knew of a path along the margin of the sea de gourgues joyfully set us all in motion again the brief rest had made new men of us and even job goddard caught some of the spirit of the adventure the path being a good one we went forward with speed and at dawn after a night of indomitable perseverance upon the part of these soldiers we reached the banks of a small stream beyond this and very near was the first of the smaller forts that had saluted the vengeance as we sailed up the coast but to our great chagrin we discovered that the tide was in and having no boats at this point we could not cross de gourgues was in a great ferment of mind for he had hoped to take the fort while the defenders slept he walked nervously up and down the bank trying in vain to find a fording place to add to the discomforts a drenching rain fell upon us and the arquebusiers had much ado to keep their gun matches alight but they held them under morions thus preserving them and screening the glow from the sentries of the spaniards the light grew fast and so we withdrew to the shelter of the thicket the fort was now plainly to be seen and the defences seemed slight and unfinished we could even mark the spaniards within yawning and stretching their arms as they crawled lazily from their beds at the call of day it was maddening to the frenchmen i could see them crouching all around me their eyes glowing like the sparks of their match cords and their hands trembling with excitement after a time which seemed interminable the tide went down or at least it fell so low that uh, the stream would not come higher than the armpits and finding a spot concealed by trees from the view of the fort the passage of this stream was begun each man tied his powder flask to his morion held his arquebus above his head with one hand and grasped his sword with the other the channel was a bed of sharp pointed shellfish and the edges of them cut the feet like knives even through our boots the frenchman rushed through the water unmindful of all save the eagerness to be within the spanish fort but as they came out from the stream lacerated and bleeding from the briars and the shells the avenger restrained them and set them in array of battle under cover of the trees where they stood panting their eyes kindling and their hearts throbbing in a frenzy of anticipation now that his quarry was in plain sight de gourgues laid his plans with the deliberation of a careful field captain sure of his position and of his men but waiting only to devise the more surely whatever happened at fort san mateo he was sure of these two forts at least when the men were all in line and looked carefully to their weapons he drew his sword so fiercely that it rang against the scabbard he pointed it through the trees look my comrades he cried there are the robbers who have stolen this land from our king there are the murderers who have butchered our countrymen 
end of chapter 24chapter twenty five of in search of mademoiselle by george gibbs recorded by tony oliva this librivox recording is in the public domain the death of the wolf the gourgues gave the word casanova with thirty men pushed forward to the fort gate while the main body of us under de gourgui ran at full speed for the glacis we were not discovered until we were well up the slope when a cannoneer who had come upon the rampart sent up a startled cry to arms to arms the french are coming the french are coming the spaniards had just finished their morning meal and came rushing up fastening on their steel pieces the gunner who had given the alarm hastily aiming his cannon at us fired wildly and the ball went crashing into the thicket he had time even to load and fire again before olotoraca who had outstripped the others ran up the glassy he leaped the unfinished ditch and drove his pike through the spaniard from breast to back pinning him to the gun carriage some of the frenchmen were by his side in a moment and jumping down into the fort they cut their way into the thick of the superior numbers who fell back before the fierce onslaught after me shouted Kazanov from the gate they fly this way at their throats may garcon cut them down de gourgui turned the rest of his men in that direction the spaniards were caught between two fires and all of those who had escaped from the fort were in prison between our party and that of casanova the indians too came thrusting upon their flanks many of them fought desperately but their efforts were futile against the whirlwind of passion of the frenchmen who beat them to the earth like chaff all except a few were killed upon the spot those who were spared were saved by the avenger for a more inglorious end during all this time we had been aware that the spaniards in the fort upon the other shore had taken alarm and were firing upon us without ceasing but when the first victory had been won de gourgui turned four of the captured cannon against them and to such good purpose that one of the spanish guns ceased firing at once the men running below in dismay then one of the boats a very large barge which by this time had arrived along shore was brought to the landing-place and eighty of us were crowded into it the river here is about a quarter of a league in width but the indians rushed into the water after us and holding their bows and arrows above their heads swam across straight as water rats their dark faces fierce and scarlet streaked seemed to darken the whole surface of the water and inspired a great fear in the spanish garrison whichever way the spanish looked there was certitude of a horrible death before them and so seized by a sudden panic they fled terrified into the woods but by this time we had landed below them and blocked their path with the arquebusiers sending charge after charge into their ranks and cutting them down without mercy they recoiled again in dismay but the indians had crawled dripping upon the beach and were upon them with savage shouts beating them down before we could come within sword thrust it was with difficulty that de gourgui could save the lives of a few and indeed he had no notion of sparing them altogether he only saved them as he had saved the others for another death 
i did not know de gourgues in the character of bloodletter he had lost that cheeriness and buoyancy that had drawn me so closely to him upon his face he wore a look of satisfaction that was a horror to see for vengeance done a man with any shred of compassion in him must now and then give vent to some expression to show that his devil craves a compromise with his god but not so de gourgues he looked at the blood about him without pity or compunction and cast upon those who had been taken so sour a look that some of them drew shuddering to the length of their bonds away from him even i accustomed as i had become to the horrors of carnage turned away in disgust for the sights i saw among the indians were too savage for description and the french were little better job goddard was everywhere in the thickest of the fighting and though he had little pity for the spaniards he like myself shrank from cutting down disarmed men once i saw a fellow whom he had spared rise upon an elbow and with his last remnant of strength send his poniard flying at my englishman it hit job fairly in the upper arm and stuck there quivering goddard nonchalantly plucked it out and put it in his belt saying a good line shot me friend but most indifferent elevation when ye wish to strike home aim high me garlic eater aim high and tis no cursed bad advice for a man about stepping across the threshold of eternity as for me all this slaughter turned my stomach and i sat apart for i had come out for no such business as this i wanted the butchery speedily over and the attack on san mateo made immediately should we be successful there i knew that other such scenes would be witnessed for de gourgues had vowed there would be no shadow of difference between the massacres of fort caroline and fort san mateo but in spite of repugnance at what would follow i hoped and prayed that we might be victorious for i felt again the same old passion to be at the throat of de bassan i made my vow that he should die only through a fair test of skill or strength with me how i might save him from those red hell-hounds our allies i did not know but if i could compass it i intended to meet him upon even terms my practice in pompey's salle d'armes should have made my sword-play good enough to cross blades with him i scarce know why this haunting desire to fight de bassan should have filled me so relentlessly through all these months and now since mademoiselle had not fallen into his hands i not he had won the game and the ancient grudge was fitter upon his side of the balance than upon mine but the gourgues had deferred the attack upon san mateo until his preparations could be carefully finished all the next day we spent in making ladders to scale the walls sending orders through saturiona and olotoraca to the indians giving them their stations in the forest and arranging that no movement should be made until a signal was given so closely had saturiona and takatakuru watched the fort that though making no attack and keeping well into the shadows of the forest they had succeeded in confining all the spaniards within their own lines those gentry heard the savage cries resounding through the woods until their echoes faded away in the distance 
there was a desperate work before them and they knew that the sounds of the war cries and the barking of the french arquebuses down the river meant a harder fight than they had ever had before they judged from the sound of the shots that the french numbered several thousand all of this we learned from a spanish soldier who ventured out feathered and painted like an indian he came within the lines of our outpost but the lynx-eyed olotoraca walking with de gourgues spied through his disguise and the man was seized before he could get away from him the avenger learned that in fort san mateo were two hundred and sixty spaniards under don diego de bassan this confirmed the report we had heard de bassan was still there i feared at this last moment of my quest that some unhappy accident might have sent him on an errand to san augustine on the evening of the second day after the first assault de gourgues well pleased and confident that his plans were carefully laid gave orders that the indians should close in upon the fort with all possible secrecy and lie in wait under the shadows of the trees and bushes of the hills and river bank before the day had broken we were in marching order and after a hearty meal went up the stream in glittering ranks joyful but steady and assured of victory de gourgues made no concealment of our movements and when we came in view of the fort we saw the battlements shining with men in armor and knew that de bassan was prepared to receive us presently when within range of their ordnance they opened fire with their culverins from a projecting bastion de gourgues broke our column and scattered us through the woods where their fire had little effect for here the forest was very thick and overgrown and afforded a most excellent cover we marched to the left passing through our indian allies who lay like snakes among the undergrowth we came at last to the top of a small hill from which we had a good view of the whole extent of the defences of fort san mateo it was plain to be seen that these had been greatly improved since its capture from laudonniere de bassan apparently had by this time lost all trace of our whereabouts thinking we had defiled by the river bank in a moment he sent a strong party of spaniards to reconnoitre they came from their works crossing the ditch and all unconscious made straight for the clump of woods in which we lay ensconced de gourgues noting the advantage of his position quickly detached casanova with a party to station himself at a point well hidden by trees where he could soon take them in the flank the spaniards unaware that they were exposing themselves to this enfilading fire with a strange insistence which seemed not unlike infatuation continued sturdily to advance now it was that the discipline of the arquebusiers of de gourgues showed to greatest advantage he had cautioned them under pain of dire punishment not to fire before the word of command in their ardor they strained forward eagerly leaning upon their rests their eyes glancing down their weapons their fingers toying lovingly with their match cords but not until the spaniards had come so near that we could plainly make out their features did the avenger give the order to fire then a deadly blaze flashed in their faces almost close enough to burn them the shock was terrific and before its echoes had rumbled up the river we were upon them through the smoke slashing and piercing right and left those who stood their ground 
driving those who ran in dire confusion back toward the fort but here casanova waited them and poured in a scorching fire at easy range which still further cut them down none escaped the pikemen of casanova charged over them again and again like demons and those few who were left threw down their weapons and fell upon their knees extending their arms and begging for mercy the fight was speedily over with no loss to us when we had mounted the hill again it was easy to see that consternation reigned in the fort soldiers ran here and there upon the battlements shouting in confusion while men women and children uttering piercing screams rushed to the gate battering upon it with their bare fists trying to force their way out that they might escape to the forest the trumpet of dariol sounding the charge rang out clear above the din never before it seemed to me had a battle blast been sent up so loud and exultant it was the signal of de gourgues through thicket and scrub down the hill for the fort we ran a very human monsoon shouting like madmen every stump and tree to the right and left of us seemed to turn by some magic into a painted savage and the air was filled with their wild screams de gourgues olotoraca and i reached the gate at the same moment followed closely by the more speedy of the rest by this time the women and children were running through the postern screaming to the forest their fate i like not to think of we were after more sturdy game most of the soldiers had fled even before the women but we saw forty or fifty spanish arquebusiers formed in the square by the corps de garde for a last resistance i knew i should find the bassin there nor was i mistaken i saw him at the same moment that he caught sight of me and we ran forward upon each other with the same full-hearted hatred that had ever envenomed us the world was too small a place for both it seemed as though the affair were to be ended one way or the other then and there but as luck would have it olotoraca being more swift of foot reached him first and began thrusting with his pike de bassan was thus put upon his guard against the indian and had all that he could do to parry his furious onslaught twice his guard lay open and i might have thrust him clear through the body but i could not bring myself to take such advantage a nimble fellow rushed at me and all but caught me off my guard giving me trouble for some minutes he was a most excellent swordsman and fought with desperation but he tired easily and while i played upon the defensive i watched de bassan and olotoraca out of the tail of my eye by this time the sword of the spaniard was hissing backward and forward like the tongue of a serpent along the pike of olotoraca the indian had not the skill of a seasoned pikeman and only made up for his lack of knowledge of the art by his great suppleness and agility suddenly i saw him lunge too far i beat the blade of my fellow down and let him go his way while i made for de bassan the spaniard seized the pike handle just behind the head and pulled the young brave forward thrusting at the same time i made a leap hoping to parry the thrust of the spaniard and partly succeeded but the sword point passed through the body of the paracousi so that he fell back upon the ground men were fighting all around us 
but by some chance we were quite alone in the shadow of the corps de garde you might have killed me he panted glancing this way and that why did you not we are quits then but it is not too late senor de Bassan. on guard still looking furtively around he made no motion to raise his bloody point from the ground but kept edging away quick sir on guard i cried or i will run you through he made a sudden leap backward and vanished quickly around the corner of the building passing several frenchmen and in the confusion reached the battlements before i could stop him and with a laugh sprang out into space without so much as looking i leaped after him into the mud and water of the river bank i landed fair up to my knees and fell over in the water for a moment i thought my legs had been driven into my body but managed to get to my feet in time to see my enemy rushing for the thicket in a second i was after him and plunged through the bushes guided by the gleam of his morion around us were shouts of french and indians and once we passed a half score red men who were dancing around a poor wretch tied to a tree they saw us go by and let fly a shower of arrows at both thinking that i too was an escaping spaniard but they did not follow us they were enjoying too horrid a pleasure to leave we ran thus for some distance when reaching a level space of ground de Bassan stopped suddenly awaiting my coming he leaned with both hands upon his blade breathing heavily his face was purple from exertion and the sweat poured from his forehead down his cheeks and into his beard i was hard put myself for breath and came forward cautiously again senor pirato he sneered with a kind of a laugh for the last time senor spaniard i said approaching for the last time ah then you do grant i am the better skilled at sword-play let us settle the matter at once said i bringing my point into line one moment he said craftily when i kill you what will become of mademoiselle i saw his object he sought to unsteady my nerves but i only laughed at him mademoiselle is in the hands of her friends seigneur come now enough you have your wind fall to or i will run you through i threw off my morion to keep my brow cool and while in the very act of tossing it aside he leaped for me engaging with such incomparable swiftness that i broke ground and gave back ten twenty paces under his fierce assault i held my own with great trouble but he saw no sign of it upon my face and it is my pride that i ever looked coldly in his eyes fearless and confident once he grazed my arm and with flashing eyes sprang forward to follow his advantage but i met him with so shrewd a guard and thrust that he drew back looking at me in surprise we heard indistinctly the cries of the soldiers and the indians at the fort and now and then a wild yell would start the echoes in the forest near us but we fought on our eyes looking into each other's glittering and more piercing even than the swords we wielded shouting was now most plainly to be heard in the direction from which we had come i heard job goddard's whistle and a cheery cry keep him at work sir we are with you in a minute diego's eyes looked over my shoulder unless you hurry don diego i said coolly bantering him there will be little time for this exhibition of sword-play you have promised me i knew could i get him angry that i might have the better advantage bah he cried furious coward you cannot fight your battles for yourself 
i am holding my own i smiled i know not just why it was but strive as he might he could get no advantage i have no memory of ever having used my sword so well quick as he was my hand was even quicker and my eye seemed by the look of his own to divine his thrust before he made it the sounds of the voices grew louder and louder each moment and seemed to be near the edge of the wood the look in the eyes of de Bassan became uncertain he had tried upon me every feint and thrust he knew and there i still stood before him smiling and confident it was not fear that he felt for i believe the man feared nothing on earth or above it or below it was an expression rather of wonder and curiosity as if at the last he saw in me the image of vengeance come to bring him in spite of his prowess the retribution he so amply deserved twice he had had me in his power my death hanging by a web so fine that he could have blasted it by the breath from his lips and still i lived all of this i saw in his look i smiled at him again and that infuriated him the more scorning all thought of defence he crouched his head and came for me desperately his feints and thrusts were quicker than thought itself and my eye bewildered could no longer follow the motions he caught the point of my blade near the hilt of his own and with a quick backstroke of the wrist sent it flying down the handle almost out of my fingers i clutched it again bringing it up to the guard but he had sprung in and thrust me through the thigh at this moment there was an outcry upon our left and de brisac with some of my seamen came running forward good-bye sir pirato laughed de Bassan. i have no time to finish this and turning he made for the opposite side of the clearing i shouted at the top of my lungs and made a leap after him but fell prone to the earth he made for a hole in the thicket and i thought must surely go free but while i looked a number of dusky figures sprang up all around him and i saw them leap upon him like hounds upon a stag he threw his arms out wildly and one of the savages who bounded into the air was skewered upon his sword while another fell away from him into the bushes as though he had been tossed by an ox the spaniard was making a wonderful fight but the indians infuriated by the fall of olotoraca went rushing fiercely forward crying that he should not escape one of them pinioned his left arm to his body and hung with a death-like clutch around his legs before saturiona reached them another more successful than the others sprang upon the back of de Bassan, and brushing off his morion struck again and again upon the bare head with his hatchet when the hollow dullness of the strokes fell upon my ear i knew that the end had come he swayed back and forth a moment striving to keep his feet unwilling to relinquish his hold upon life fighting even when death had come then with a groan like that of some hunted animal turned half around and sank to the ground dead where he had stood when he had fallen the savages fell upon the prostrate body like wolves tearing at the clothing and would have beaten him with their war clubs as he lay had not de brisac and saturiona come up i cried out to them that it was the commandante of the fort whom they had killed de brisac was among them striking with the flat of his sword and crying stop you dogs away with you stop i say he stood over the body with his drawn sword while they glowered at him and would have struck him down had not saturiona come between 
at last the paracousi with a few words sent them away their gruesome fancies ungratified it was a dog's death for so valiant a man pulled down like some wild beast of the forest when i had been carried to where the body lay de brisac and i vowed that he should have a decent burial i hated him and hate him now but it was a passion made great by the intensity of it and i could not bear that the majesty of his prowess should be dimmed by any ignominy at his death de brisac fearing to bury him in the knowledge of the indians gave orders to the seamen that he should be taken to fort san mateo when i had bound up my leg thither we presently repaired i leaning upon the arms of job goddard and brezac end of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of in search of mademoiselle by george gibbs recorded by tony oliva this librivox recording is in the public domain and last and so it was all over the mission of de gourgues was ended however bloody the retribution he had wrought upon his enemies france was avenged i was thankful that my flight into the woods had spared me much of the butchery at fort san mateo what we saw in the forest was horrible enough and though by the time we returned the fort had been cleared a dreadful climax to this grim tragedy was being enacted as we entered the postern gate we saw de gourgues standing menacing sinister and pitiless before the ranks of trembling haggard wretches who had been spared from the massacre they were not many and the slenderness of their number was a dire augury of the punishment which was to be theirs they did not know what was to come they scanned the merciless man who stood before them seeking to find in the lines of his face one trace of sorrow or pity but the eyes where pity might have been were set and fixed hard as the lines of the nose and mouth the brows had lost their melancholy and were drawn into a tangle and snarl of wrinkles which took away every vestige of the man i knew and loved he returned their look with a glance from which they cowered as though he had struck them a glance that meant but one thing and that was the end a few of them stood upright and fearless others fell down upon their knees whimpering the end holy virgin what end what death when the avenger spoke his voice was dry and hard as flint did you think he said that so vile a treachery so detestable a cruelty against a king so potent and a nation so fearless would go unpunished hell knows no viler traitor than your master menendez de aviles of whom you are but the spawn no i am only one of the humblest of the subjects of my king but i have charged myself with avenging the deeds of this menendez and yours against my hapless countrymen there is no name base enough to brand your actions no punishment sharp enough to requite them but though you cannot suffer as you deserve you shall suffer all that an enemy can honourably inflict 
that your example may teach others to observe the peace and alliance between our kings which you have so perfidiously violated then he waved his hand and the wretches were marched out through the gate down to the river some of them cried aloud that they would not go others clasped the knees of the french arquebusiers sobbing out like women in their degradation that they had helped to hang the frenchman of fort caroline that they had confessed and hoped for mercy these were rudely dragged to their feet and prodded with pikes until they followed the others trembling in an agony of fear when they had come to a place near the river the indians pointed out to de gourgues the trees upon which the frenchmen of fort caroline had hung de brezac and i knew them well and upon these same trees without other speech or ceremony the spaniards were hanged after it was over de gourgues caused tablets of pine to be nailed over their heads where all men might read upon these tablets were inscriptions burned with a hot iron which read not as to spaniards but as to traitors robbers and murderers his vengeance was complete that night when it was dark de brezac job goddard and another buried de bassan deep in a sand dune indian messengers were sent to the river of takatakuru to bring the vengeance and others vessels into the river of may but at dawn the following morning we saw them passing the forts at the river's mouth and we knew that the anxiety of francois bourdelais had got the better of him when those on the vessel saw the standards of france waving upon the battlements of the lower forts their cannon boomed forth a joyous salute which was answered there and at san mateo before noon they anchored near the fort and i was carried aboard to mademoiselle i could not suffer her to go ashore while traces of the slaughter were in such ghastly evidence for there were sights to cloud and torment throughout all recollection a mind innocent of the indecencies of life already the vultures were wheeling high over the forest and i prayed that the business which still kept the avenger would soon be concluded we were sick of the place and mademoiselle and i had no desire to go upon the shore in the afternoon mahira came aboard unable to stay at the takatakuru river while these great events were going forward she had followed us and lain in concealment since the attack to mademoiselle she brought a message from olotoraca who was at the indian encampment not dead but very sorely wounded from the thrust de bassan had given him and who wished mademoiselle to go to him i would have deterred her for i knew not what design he might cherish mahira understood me but she smiled as she had not smiled since i had seen her the white giant has no need to fear olotoraca knows all and it is well he has a great friendship for the white giant mademoiselle started up i must go sydney there will be no harm and if he wishes me i cannot leave this land without seeing him mahira would not give me bad counsel the moon princess will take no hurt i could not be satisfied to have her out of my sight but asked Casanova to take some men and go with her they were gone a long time and when they returned mademoiselle was smiling and tranquil olotoraca was very weak but would recover 
he said that i the white giant had parried the blow which had wounded him and so had saved his life he wished to live fair in the memory of the white giant he was glad that the moon princess was safe with me it is not well he had said at last taking mahira's hand in his that a man should love at all unless of the people of his own race had i been able to go to him i would have clasped him heartily by the hand but they told me i must lie quiet for fear of setting loose an artery and so i stayed on my pallet fanned by the cool breezes of the sea and blessed by the sight of diane who sat near at hand with beaming eyes ministering to me the capture of the spanish fort had in one way been a great godsend to her for in the quarters of the women de brisac had found a box full of linen and silks and a few things even that had been brought to florida by mademoiselle herself these the chevalier sent to her with a gracious word as her share of the spoils the silks were of no very recent fashion to be sure but all the gold and silver in the world could not have contributed so much as these to mademoiselle's content nor were they of any particular kind of shape hanging about her slender figure like lean biscuit bags but with ready grace and wit she made shift to fasten and tuck them so that after all they were none so bad as they might have been she was so sweet and graceful a sight to my eyes that i feared should i close them i would lose not only the vision but the reality and find myself again upon the sand spit at paris or in the forest seeking her ever with new hopes which were born only to be blasted again and again at last i slept and the morning sun was breaking across the narrow cabin as i wakened when i had eaten i felt so strong and well that i would have risen but diane pressed me quietly by the shoulders and would not permit it after a while when all was ready my pallet was carried up on the aftercastle in the shadow of an awning where i lay with several others and watched the fellows upon the shore they were busy as bees and i felt a lazy dolt to be lying there twiddling my thumbs two or three times the unruly and riotous spirit engendered by shedding of blood broke forth among the frenchmen but so complete was the control and discipline which de gourgues had put upon them that little harm was done once they had broken into a wine cask without his knowledge and there was like to be a repetition of the affair of cabouche it is a strange thing that cabouche himself who had often made good his boast of bully of the forecastle should have been the one to put this small mutiny down for he stood in the doorway of the wine-room pointing his arquebus toward his companions and vowing he would shoot the one who advanced it was said when it was done and they had retreated that he disappeared into the darkness and took a good punch full himself coming forth with a strong smell of alcohol hanging about him in the afternoon there was a wonderful scene de gourgues gathered all the indians about him under the battlements and through dariol made them a long speech from time to time they uttered loud cries which broke in upon his words when he had done a prolonged yell came from the savages and they swarmed over the ill-fated fort looking 
not unlike a swarm of ants upon a hill of their own they rushed through the living quarters and the barracks and out upon the roofs tearing and rending until it seemed as though some movement of the earth or elements were splitting the buildings to pieces in two hours the corps de garde was raised to the ground meanwhile a great number had mounted the battlements and with pikes pieces of iron and any rough implements that came to hand began prying the stones from their places with savage cries of exultation they tossed these out into the river or threw them in the ditch or thicket a dust arose which hid them from our sight but they worked on as though maddened in the heat and glare until sundown when not one stone was left upon another it was a whirlwind of ruin that night when i heard the preparations above me for sailing on the morrow it seemed impossible that only a week and three days had passed since we had come to anchor in the takatakuru since we had made our league found mademoiselle passed the hardships of the march and attack and come to the successful ending of our expedition de courgue said little when he had finished speaking to the indians he had come aboard and set all the seamen to work stowing the vessel and breaking out the spars and sails for the voyage that night mademoiselle and mahir bade a tearful good-bye for they had come to love each other with a fond affection and to this day i cannot forget the services the indian maiden did for me and mine on the morrow the anchors were broken out and with a favoring breeze we moved slowly down the river toward the sea while the indians shouting messages of good will to us ran along the banks until the freshening wind had driven us from their sight when the ships passed the smaller forts i could see that there too the work of destruction had been complete for the stones and fascines were scattered in all directions and only a few overturned and broken gun-rests showed where the bastions had been we sailed out over the bar at high tide and with a last salute to our friendly hosts he set our prow squarely abreast the broad surges for france in a few days i could almost crawl about the decks without an arm to steady me in two weeks i went about some simple duties and in the long summer twilights mademoiselle and i would sit high up on the slanting after castle near the lanterns looking back down the pink swirling wake toward the land where we had both suffered so much of de bassan we spoke but once i let fall a word of regret that so gallant and splendid a fighter should have been of so ill-favoured a disposition but mademoiselle made me no reply with the thought how near she had come to falling into his hands after the capture of fort caroline she shuddered drew closer to me and would hear of him no more we had too many present joys to conjure up the miseries that were past we had been born into a new world of our own and we peopled it with fancies as blithe as ourselves under the laughing stars we were creatures of unreality unconscious of all save the great love which had conquered everything de gourgues sat with us sometimes but not for long for there is no pain keener than that which comes from seeing a forbidden joy through the eyes of another my tale is soon ended we reached rochelle after a voyage of little event and were greeted with great honor so soon as it could be accomplished and that was with 
such speed of habit and frock-making as was never known before or since diane and i were married the endurance and strength of heart which bore her up in all her sufferings among these wild western forests has to this day of our age and contentment been my sturdiest prop in times of stress i need not tell at length how through coligny the prize money for the san cristobal was turned over at last to captain hooper and how upon a certain successful voyage from plymouth i came to be his second in command nor how i owned my own vessel before my mistress had dominique and little diane well out of their swaddling clothes the chevalier de brezac has come back from his voyage with sir walter raleigh m de teligny is dead leaving the chevalier a great fortune and he is now out upon a venture of his own job goddard hoary-headed and staunch but convincing and windy worded as ever sits smoking at his window in the pelican with martin cockram and the two rogues gathering the growing youth of the docks about them with easy elaboration tell wonderful yarns of voyages to strange countries where people walk upside down and of a preference use their toes for fingers to which the urchins listen their wide mouths agape and their eyes agog with curiosity job has set about planting a patch of tobacco at plymouth but his pursuit has fared ill and so he gets the leaf in bales from the ships that come laden to plymouth from the western main it is history how de gourgues was spurned at paris by that weakling charles how our own good queen bess of england offered him a command and how charles thereupon relented and would have given him a position of authority but de gourgues was never a stranger to adversity and through it all his great grief has ever been that menendez de aviles escaped the vengeance at san mateo of which he had been the dearest object this malefactor died full of honour and riches high in the favour of philip of spain who had he lived would have given him command of the great armada that spanish fleet so long threatened has come and gone through the good offices of sir francis drake and lord howard for both of whom my father had performed some service i was given considerable responsibility and command upon drake's own revenge acquitting myself to the great admiral's satisfaction so that i came into the royal service again as commander of the white bear and gained for myself many emoluments and honours by great good fortune i thus won my way into the notice of the queen and so through her generosity was enabled in some sort to restore my family to the prestige it had enjoyed before the imprudences and generosities of my grandfather and father had depleted the value of the estates i lay no claim to credit for these achievements had it not been for diane i should have made no attempt to regain the position of my family before the court her soft influences strong and womanly have weaned me away from the boisterous habits of my wild young life and have shown me the value of the refinements which come of gentle living with the death of the queen mother in france there came to a change in the fortunes of diane and the great henry the greatest henry of navarre 
with that rare grace which has ever distinguished him has given back again the estate of la notte at villeneuve to my wife thither at certain seasons we go forming thus another link not without a certain value between two great christian monarchs diane has built a summer-house on her estate and she has fashioned it after the lodge of olotoraca where during those long months she waited for me it is not in a wild pine forest where every night the winds may sing their grand and lonely psalms it is on the borders of a quiet lake where soft sweeping willows whisper with the rippling water and tall poplars like sentinels guard us against the legions of unrest when the sun has set and the slender moon has sailed out across the deep green vault above us then we sit hand in hand dreaming and at peace i and mademoiselle end of chapter twenty six the end of in search of mademoiselle by george gibbs